Praise the Lord, everyone, and uh, welcome to another wonderful week where we get to discuss the good things of the Word of God. And so we're excited to have this opportunity to get together to, as a collective community, um, dig deeper into the things of God. And so we want to get started by inviting the presence of God to be made known to us so that he can reveal what his mind and heart and desire is and reveal himself through the pages of his word. And so let's, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for putting this desire in our heart. Lord, we know none can come except you draw them. And we know the very desire, Lord, comes from you. Lord, it is you who works in us both to will and to do of your pleasure. So God, as we gather together here, I pray that it would be fruitful. I pray that you would reveal yourself to us. I pray that knowledge will increase and not just general knowledge, but the knowledge of who you are, Lord, and that we will be empowered, oh God, and transformed by your word to go and Lord, become, oh God, what you have designed and destined us to become so that we can, Lord, be tools in your hand to advance your kingdom. God, do what only you can do, we pray. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so we are in Mark chapter six. We've been uh, discussing Mark chapter six for a couple of sessions now. It is a lengthy chapter, uh, 50, 53, 56 verses. Um, and so it's it's taken us some time, but we haven't uh, rushed through Mark. And I think that's one of the things that we want to be aware of is that we don't want to necessarily rush through our study of the word of God, but take our time and really uh, be patient and allow the Lord to speak to us. And also conversely, as we engage with the text collectively to allow um, different perspectives, different insights, different revelations that God may uh, deposit into individuals who are participating to help advance the collective understanding and revelation and deepness of the knowledge of, of, of who God is as revealed to us from the scripture. And so we've been um, discussing uh, in particular uh, Mark chapter 6 uh, verses 30 to 34 and there's some themes that we we talked about just the idea of rest and, and what that looks like and the miraculous provision of Jesus not only to his disciples but also to those who demonstrated a need and also Jesus's concern and care and his presentation as the good shepherd, the one who takes care of the sheep, the one who leads the sheep, the one who protects the sheep, the one who provides for the sheep. And towards the end of our last session, we got into a discussion around um, one of the verses in Mark chapter 6 in particular, uh, verse 41 that said, uh, actually verse 42, that said they all ate and were satisfied. And we explored uh, what that could possibly mean in in today's environment in today's culture if in fact it we could make the claim or the statement that because of this demonstration and the expression that they all ate and were satisfied and so we sort of explored if um our faith in Jesus causes all of our needs and wants to be met and we sort of talked through that and came to a conclusion that really Jesus provides our needs and and this doesn't support the claim that all of our wants would be uh, provided for us. And so um, that's a summary of uh, Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 44. And we'll move on to the rest of the chapter. But before we do, I just wanted to give an opportunity to anyone to make any comments. Part of what the takeaway ask was from our last session was for everyone to, one, read um, Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 44, and just reflect on uh, the events of the scripture there, and then also to read the rest of the chapter, and just to reflect on some of the some of the discussion that we had. And so if there was anything that occurred to anyone, maybe a new insight, a new revelation, maybe a different vantage point or train of thought, or maybe a question that you'd like to introduce to the discussion, I'd uh, make room for that now. So I open the floor to Anyone who has any feedback, comments, any insight that you'd like to provide from our last discussion?
I'll, I'll give everyone another moment just to kind of reflect um, on the scripture and, and see if there's any, any commentary, any questions, any feedback. So is this regarding the, the faith versus sight? Just so that was part of the discussion that we had last session. So it could be um, on that topic or any other element that occurred to you from the last discussion, or maybe in your review of uh, Mark chapter 6, 30 to 44, maybe something that we didn't talk about came into your consciousness or your, your thought process and that you wanted to introduce to the discussion. And so I just wanted to create some space just for us to engage and if not then we can you know move on to the rest of the chapter but i wanted to at least create a space for, for any feedback that anyone may have had haven't gone away and reflected on the, the text well i had i had a something i was thinking about when i was reading the verse of uh let me get the actual verse here hmm. Coming down. Okay, when the disciples told Jesus that the people were hungry, and Jesus told them to to feed them, the question that you posed last week when we ended it was, or there's a I have my notes. It was a faith whether were they operating by faith or by sight, and my initial thought to that was they're operating by sight. Because Jesus expected them to have faith, I'm, I'm guessing. But what I was thinking about was, how did Jesus expect the disciples to feed the five thousand? So, so that's actually um, a, a really great question, mm -hmm. and I think it 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 requires some um, contemplation. So, I. I'm not sure that Jesus's focus was necessarily for the disciples to feed the um, the crowd, but I think what's what's in focus is the fact that Jesus had compassion on them. And so one of the things that we were talking about was Jesus as the good shepherd. And so if you if you recall the text, he kind of had gone to that location because his concern was for the disciples they had just come from a mission where jesus had sent them out to preach and to heal and they came back and they were they were exhausted and so part of the thing was we discussed about rest and the principle of rest or sabbath and the principle of sabbath and we we talked a little bit about that and one of the key elements was that even in our rest or our separation from ministry work jesus was still with them and so it's it would seem to me that his his interest was the expression of compassion that the translation and the transfer of compassion and so they came to him and they were like well send them away so that they can go and get food but but jesus as the good shepherd is concerned with taking care of the sheep providing for the sheep guiding the sheep protecting the sheep and so as the good shepherd he his concern is taking care of the sheep and his 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 process in discipling is the extension of his ministry the the extension of the kingdom of god and so really as disciples the expectation would be for us to carry on the mission the mission of jesus and so a big part of that would be the expectation that we would have compassion and so that's one piece and then secondly we we sort of see a trend as Jesus is moving through the book of the book of Mark, um, the the demonstration of the miraculous power, and so theoretically we would expect the disciples' faith in the demonstration of Jesus's power to grow. So they may not have seen necessarily a pathway of how it was going to happen, but they're, in my view likely should have been a little bit more confidence in Jesus's capacity to do something because at this stage they've seen Jesus do some phenomenal feats and so there's also that faith component that should have in in the experiences that they have that that, that they had had 
seen a growth in faith. And so they may not have understood how it was going to happen, but they there should have been a little bit more expectation that Jesus could actually do something to help the people. And so there's there's those two elements in 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 I think in in response to that question. But that's a great question. Um, I'd like to throw it out to the, the 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 greater collective as well to see if anyone else has any feedback, any commentary, anything else that occurred to you um, in relation to Brother Dijon's question. Brother Chris. Tavera, yes. Yeah. Uh, in my observation, um, <clears throat> Jesus, he knows their heart. Their heart was to follow Jesus, to see the miracles, to see everything, what he's doing. And he knows their need at that time. And uh, need and want, we want a lot, but <laughs> our need, Jesus supply our need. Our want, even in the answer, it, it doesn't mean he doesn't want <laughs> to give us, he knows what is good for us. So at that time, they were fed by the word of God, by the miracles, they were not even take a look for the food themselves. If they look, they are hungry, I have to go to eat, they can go to their village or somewhere. But God wants, he saw his, their heart and he told them to give them food. And the, the disciples, they said, uh, they don't have, but God knows. He's a provider. He provides them by the two fish and five loaves. And the, the one I don't understand is, this is the first miracle he did. And uh, we didn't reach that, but I can, I can mention it. In the second one or so, the same thing they answer, we don't have. So it shows me we didn't, sometimes we didn't pay attention God's work. We use our mentality, the way human <laughs> thinking. So that's why twice they are disciples. They, he's, he's alive with them. He's divine, he's divine and he's God and he's human, full human, full divine. He was with them. They see him. So why is it is like that? Why from the first uh, he provides them for 5,000 by two fish and uh, five loaves? They didn't even learn and the second one also, the same question we don't have. So my understanding is uh, he, the Lord knows our need and he supplies their need, no matter what, whether they have or not. So the bottom line is to live content. Well, if he so give us, so, yeah. Go ahead, no, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Sister yeah, if he, give, if he give us shelter, food, our fridge is full. Nothing to complain. If we don't have even, we don't have to complain. We have to ask him. He's a provider. We learn from that. In Jesus' name, that's my <laughs> comment. No, uh, thank you, Sister Tabera. Those are actually uh, some really great observations and some great commentary just around the recognition of who Jesus is and also their their level of faith in response to the things that they've seen and i think that's really a great segue into the portion of scripture that we're going to cover today because a lot of those elements are present in the next series of events which really seem to be a continuous story from 
the feeding of the 5,000 miracle right into what we see next in the scripture. And so, so thank you for those comments. Very insightful. Uh, so with that, we're going to turn our attention to um, Mark chapter 6, and we're going to continue reading. So we're going to pick up reading from uh, verse 45, and we'll go right until um, the end of the chapter, verse 56. And so I'm reading from the New International uh, Version. Please feel free to follow along with the version that you're used to reading. So Mark uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Beth uh, Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountain side to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into the villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all were touched, and all who touched it were healed. Amen. Phenomenal. So we want to sort of look at um, Mark 6, 45 to 52, and then we can briefly discuss um, 53 to 56. And so in, in, in this portion of scripture, one of the, the key themes is really this idea that seems to be reoccurring um, from, from Mark 4, 41 and Mark 6, 14 uh, to 16. And so if I can get a volunteer just to remind us of what those verses say, if someone can uh, find Mark uh, chapter 4, verses 41, and then if someone else can find Mark uh, 16, 14 to 16, just to sort of remind us of, of what the focus or the theme of these verses seem to be. So uh, can I get a volunteer to read Mark 4, 41? I'll read, Brother Chris. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obeyed, obey him. So, so that's a reference back to the events of uh, the end of Mark chapter 4, where it's another uh, miracle where Jesus demonstrates his authority over nature. And the prevailing question is, is, is the identity of Jesus. Uh, Mark chapter 6, 14 to 16. Can I get a volunteer yeah, to read? I'll read Mark 6, 14 to 16. Yes, thank you, Sister Henry. Okay, King, Her King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that it and that is why miraculous power are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. So, so, so. Sorry, go ahead. Was that that's the end of the verses? Yes. That's 16, yes, sir. Yep. Yep. So 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 Mark is explicit in his interest in 
raising the question and, and illuminating the question about who Jesus is, the identity of Jesus. And it seems to be the result of miracles or, or the demonstration of divine power that Jesus demonstrates. And so when, 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 when we see these events, when we, when we hear about these miracles, the, there's a prevailing question. Who is Jesus? What is the identity of Jesus? And from the text that we read, looking at verses 51 and 52, there seems to be also this dynamic of the relationship of the disciples to the divine power that Jesus is demonstrating. And so we hear some comments that Mark makes around this miracle on the, on the water, the demonstration of his authority over nature, but it seems to be connected to the previous miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 because Mark relates it back in terms of their relationship and their understanding to the events of the miracle of the 5,000 and also their amazement of Jesus coming on the water. So there, there's a linkage there between this event and the previous event, and the linkage is really focused on the disciples and their response. And so the question then becomes the identity of Jesus. And so some scholars see the, the walking of Jesus on the water as an expression of the divine, as sort of a, a demonstration of a, a, a manifestation or a showing of Jesus' true identity, the divinity that is within him. And so if I can get a volunteer to read um, uh, Job chapter 9, verse 8, and then if I can find another volunteer to read um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. So Job chapter 9, verse 8, um, if one volunteer... The Lord stretches that. out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. That's Job eight, 9, verse 8. If you can read that again. I must apologize. Sorry about that. That's okay. Job 9, verse 8, he alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. And so, so here in the book of Job is a reference to God walking on the waves of the sea. And so if we can have a volunteer read Genesis 1, chapter 2. Genesis 1, verse 2. I'm reading from the New International Version. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We Thank you so much. No, no, that just, just to, um, there are other versions that say the spirit of the Lord moved on the face of the waters. And so here again is a, a scripture indicating the, the moving of the spirit on the water. And so when you look at those two scripture references, there's a certain, um, divine expression that comes from the Lord in relation to the water. And so we have here Job making reference to, to God as the one who moves on the waves. And in the very beginning, we see the earth was, 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 was without form and void. And the spirit of the Lord begins moving on the face of the waters. And so here comes Jesus walking on the water. And so, so some scholars sort of see uh, a divine expression there. And it, it gets back to the whole question of who is Jesus. And so um, so scholars would, would say that um, the verses that we read in particular verses, um, Mark chapter six, verses 45 to um, 50, 52, and, and really sort of a, a, a microcosm or a, a small expression of the overall book as having a Christological focus. And so uh, Christology then is the branch of Christian theology that is focused on the person, nature, and role of Christ. So Christology is all about 
understanding who Christ is, his nature, his person, and the role that Christ plays in Christianity, in our salvation, in our faith. And so we read other references to Christological concerns. Mark 4, 41 and Mark uh, 6, 16, sorry, 14 to 16. These are what we would call Christological concerns. The question is around who is Jesus? And so it, 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 the dynamic becomes really interesting because here are these disciples who spent a great amount of time with Jesus. And by this point, they would have seen the demonstration of the miraculous. But the, 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 the circulating question, which we see kind of come to a crescendo, as we'll see in, in, in Mark, you know, we continue on in Mark. But there's this building tension around who Jesus is. And it comes out really after the demonstration of the miraculous. But the disciples' proximity to Jesus and the miraculous is one that's really interesting as it relates to the identity of Jesus. And so if anyone really should have known who Jesus was, it likely should have been the disciples. But this raises the question around Jesus and the Christological concern. Is Jesus's divinity discerned or revealed? Is Jesus's divinity discerned or revealed? It's a question that has significance when we look at the experience of the disciples, sort of the original context, the original setting, but also it has some real life current applications around understanding who Jesus is. Is it something that we can discern or is it something that has to be revealed to us? Is it possible? Now, this is a philosophical question that requires contemplation, but I think can be answered from the experience of the disciples. Is it possible that you could spend time with Jesus, be exposed to Jesus's teaching, experience the miraculous power of Jesus and still not know his true identity? So I see Brother Dijon's hand. I see Sister Magda says uh, revealed. So Sister Magda is of the uh, disposition that um, the divinity of Jesus is revealed, not discerned. Um, Brother Dijon, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's both. I think Jesus, Jesus' divinity is revealed. He reveals himself, his, himself. But the disciples weren't, at least to the disciples, they weren't, they didn't discern it, is my opinion. Like, so he showed himself, he showed his powers, he showed what he can do. And it took multiple recurrences, and they still didn't believe. So I think it's revealed and discerned. He can reveal his power to you. Today, tomorrow, the next day. That doesn't necessarily mean that you will believe and see his power for yourself. Could be wrong. No, that that's really great insight. Uh Sister Keisha, I see your hand. Do you would you like to make some comments also? Yes, I just wanted to turn our attention to Matthew. 16 uh, verses 13 um, and just I'll just read the portion of scripture it says when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples who do people say the son of man is 
They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked, what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And it says, Jesus replied, because blessed are you, Simon, son of Jude, Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. So I believe that um, it is revealed, but it's by the spirit of God. God reveals himself, his divinity. Okay, no, that, that's great insight and, uh, and feedback. And anyone else care to um, share any contributions around this? this knowledge or um, understanding of Jesus's divinity, because we do uh, in some ways really see an expression of that and without it being expressly stated. And so Sister, Sister Keisha made reference to the event in, in Matthew, and we're going to come to this event, which is almost like a, a sort of a, a pinnacle of, of the book of Mark in, in chapter eight, sort of this central um, tension that really from that pinnacle, we see the book sort of shift gears in its focus around what true discipleship looks like. But um, that that's great insight and, and commentary. Anyone else care to, to share any feedback on what Sister um, Keisha has shared or Brother De Dejan has shared or, or anything else that may occur to you or or any revelations or insights that you have around what we've, we've talked about? Because this mark is very much concerned with spending time focusing on the identity of Jesus. He's he has a he has a an intensely I would say Christological concern. His focus on on Christology is is evident woven throughout, particularly the first half of the book, um, the uh, Mark one to eight, uh, Sister Frederica, and then uh, Sister Anne Marie. Um, praise the Lord, everyone. <laughs> is the question that you asked, Brother Chris, in terms of the situation here where Jesus walks on the sea, or are you talking overall? Because I'm struggling to see how, think about it, the disciples, they were on a boat, the wind was ramping up, so they were struggling with that. I don't know how bright it was that time of the morning. So I don't know if I see something on the water that I'm going to say that that is Christ at that particular time. So I'm just wondering if you're talking about that particular situation or overall. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, we've looked at um, the walking on water. So this is this is Jesus. So they they're gone out. the The Bible tells us that you know they were they were they were going, they're rowing contrary to the to the wind. Um, you know they were they were going contrary to the forces. And here here comes Jesus walking on the water, and he's about to pass by them. And then you know they're afraid. Um, you know, thinking it's a ghost, it's a spirit. They cry out, and then Jesus calms everything. And he comes into the boat and we're told that they were amazed, which naturally they would be. And they started talking about it. But then Mark makes this interesting commentary. So in all of this, and I want to actually go back and read it just to sort of frame what we're talking about here as it relates to the, the identity of Jesus. And so Mark says, Mark frames it this way. He says, in verse 51, he says, then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. Then he makes this comment. He says, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. And so what I'm looking at, one, just kind of evaluating the text and seeing the correlations between Jesus walking on the water and what the scripture would have said about the relation of the Lord and water. So I read a couple of scriptures that sort of imply that the, the walking on water or moving on water is an expression of divinity. When you take that one event 
and also compile it with other events. So Mark links the walking on the water event to the feeding of the 5,000 event as it relates to their faith. But even if you look at some of the previous miracles, um, exorcisms or demonstration of Jesus's power that came before it, they all sort of raise questions about the identity of Jesus. And, and many of them could indicate a, the presence of the divine, maybe not a, a full understanding of messianic divinity, but certainly a demonstration of the divine. Because if you go back to early chapter three or in chapter three, there was a conversation around Jesus's demonstration of power over spirits and the, the Pharisees related it to the power of Satan. And so Jesus made his commentary around, you know, for forgivable sins. But but already we see an association of Jesus's action to divine or in the case of the Pharisees accusations. Um, darkness or evil spirits. And so I raised the question because of the parallels between Jesus walking on the water. The scripture says about God in the water uh, as revealing the divine if the nature of jesus's divinity can be revealed or discerned so that was sort of um framing what we're talking about based on this event and previous events does that help sort of frame what the question is here i don't know if you want to reflect on what i just said and then maybe make some comments i uh Brother Finlater, I see your hand, but I also know that um, Sister Anne-Marie also had her hand. So I'm going to go to uh, Sister Anne-Marie, come to you. And then I see um, Sister Mitzi also says revealed. Uh, Brother Chris, just um, based on my understanding, I could be wrong, but I think it's both discerned and revealed. Because I was just thinking mm -hmm. about also Isaiah 44, verse 18 um, from the ESV version Bible. They know not nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so they cannot see and their hearts so they cannot understand. And I believe at the time the Lord basically did not reveal himself to them in that way. Like they know his power, but I guess they didn't know to the extent of his power. Um, just, just my understanding, or maybe he, he just didn't reveal everything to them at the moment like so when he come to them you know like just it's for them to try to know exactly who he is and that power that he had to walk on water that's my understanding okay no that's that's actually some great feedback thank you uh let me go to sister uh, sorry let me go to brother uh finn later and then i'm not sure if sister frederica has any additional comments so we'll 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 create a space for that if you have anything else sister frederica Oh, yes. uh, Chris, I would yes. say that it is uh, discerned if the disciples of experience are seeing God, uh, Christ's um, demonstration of his power, right, to heal, to multiply their loaves on the fishes and stuff, then that should raise their understanding of who he is. So when, he, when they see him walking in the water, because of the, the previous miracles, I think they should, it should be a discernment that this is, it is Christ's demonstration, is divinity. Okay, so you're you're of the discernment camp. Well, as, as Brother John says, I could be both, but as I says, oh. as you experience Christ over, over a period of time, you should be able to discern whether or not um, because of, his, of who he is, right? That nothing should be impossible uh, for him because he's God manifested in flesh. So there's no limitation of what he can do. So so I think um, the outcome of our position on that really has some um, relevant real world implications for us today are how we come to 
the understanding of who Jesus is, which is certainly uh, a concern that, that Mark has as the forefront of his intention for compiling this account of the good news and sharing it with his original audience and the implications for us today. And so when you look at Mark chapter four, verses 35 to 41, we just read the end part of it, sort of Jesus, is, Jesus speaking to the wind and them obeying and the disciples obviously having a natural response to what they just demonstrated, wondering out loud what type of person this is or who this was. And then here again, we see Jesus demonstrating authority over nature, just multiplying a couple of fish and, you know, uh, some loaves of bread, just again, just supernaturally superseding the, the natural order of events. And so um, scholars see, again, sort of a divine expression in that. And I think if you if you go a little bit further, which some some scholars um, draw some parallels with one, we kind of talked about it, the idea of Jesus walking on the water and what we've seen in scripture as it relates to God and the water. Even further, if you take it a little bit further, because this the scripture um, in this 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 uh this boat miracle says, you know, Jesus was going to pass pass by them. And so if I can get a um, volunteer to read Exodus 33. Um, so Exodus 33, 18 to 23. So I'm going to ask someone to get that ready. And then secondarily, I'm going to ask uh, someone to get um, 1 Kings uh, 19, um, 10 to 12 ready. So um, Exodus 33, verse. Yeah, no, just, just, uh, I just want you to get it ready. Um, so Exodus 33, 18 to 23. And then if I can have another volunteer um, get First Kings 19, 10 to 12 ready. Uh, Sister Frederica, I see your hand. So I'd like to um, come back to you. Okay, thank you. I didn't completely understand at first your question, but now I do. Thank you okay. for the clarification. Okay, um, I just wanted to... I guess in my head, our revelation of Christ is progressive. So there is the initial revelation of who God is. Scales are removed for, from our eyes per se. The spirit draws us and we respond. But our full revelation of who God is, is through life experiences. And even when we see with the disciples, it's through what they experienced with Christ that that revelation came. And I think it's the same with us. As we journey along with God and he moves in our lives in different ways, then we can say, yes, God is a healer. Yes, God works miracles in this way because we experience it. So I think there is a part for progressive, I guess that you would call it progressive revelation of who Christ is in our lives. That's a, that's a really interesting insight. And to be honest, I've never really thought about it that way, but when you, um, when you survey how um, the Lord dealt with Israel and, and even humanity through the Old Testament, there is that clear progressive revelation of his divine nature and ultimately the, the plan that he had to, reconcile humanity to himself. So I think that that's a great observation. Um, Brother Dijon, see your hand also. I just went back to read Sister Keisha's verse that she shared of the who do, who do you say I am? And it, reading it over, it says that for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but, but by my father in heaven. And then the, another verse that Sister Anne Marie pointed out, and she said, I can't, I don't have it, so I don't, I don't, I might misquote it, but it was that 
God closes their eyes to discernment. So I think I want to change my answer from revealed and discerned to just revealed. Because if you are able to discern that this is God's spirit or God's power, then it was revealed to you through God. Now, yeah, this is my answer. And I'm sticking to it. But I think it's revealed. <laughs> so I just wanted to... So no, thank okay, you. no, no, thank you. And you know what? This is, uh, I think, in, in us getting together and discussing this, we see evolution and even our own understanding, our own perspective. And, and in discussion, we could actually evolve looking at the scriptures. So I think that's a that's a great insight and very authentic. And so I encourage um, all of us to openly and honestly and actively engage with the text because the, the spirit of the Lord is, is active as we invited the presence of the Lord. We know God is everywhere at all times. We invited God to reveal his presence or make his presence known. And in that, the spirit of God is actively engaged in our discussion, you know, enlightening minds. And so I think, I think that that's, that's amazing. That's really um, why we gather together in this, this, Berean form to really dig into the scripture to really understand what the scripture is saying to us. Okay, so if I can have someone read Exodus chapter 33, uh, verses 18 to 23. Again, I'm reading from the New International Version, Exodus 33, verses 18 to 23. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name. The Lord is your presence. In your presence, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will pass, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will be, then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Thank you, Sister Green. And someone um, can take the first Kings 19, 10 to 12 uh, reference. I'll go ahead if no one does. <clears throat> Not, okay, First King 19, 10 to 12. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Thank you. So both of those scripture references relate to the expression of divine glory in the form of passing by the individuals that God was engaging with. In one, the Exodus text, it was Moses. In another, the, the first Kings uh, text, it was Elijah. And so... Um, uh, Pastor Adrian also uh, did some some preaching on uh, this whole Exodus event where the Lord passed by, or the Lord made his glory to pass by Moses. 
And so when you put together the scriptures that we just talked about as far as the divine moving on the face of the water, and then also putting together this idea or this notion that has been expressed in, in, in the Old Testament of God causing his glory to pass by. And you bring those elements into this event where Jesus comes to them walking on the water and he's about to pass them by until they sort of cry out, sort of looking at those two elements of divine expression scholars see jesus demonstrating his divine nature and so so one did let me ask uh, the question in 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 your reading of this text and i'm sure you've possibly read through this text you know several times did you ever make the correlation of Jesus walking on the water to the spirit of the Lord moving on the face of the water or even the the passing by of Jesus in relation to the the glory of God being made to pass by Moses or Elijah has anyone ever ever made that connection I can't really say that I have until I sort of started digging into um the text a little bit deeper and so it got to this point where I, I see that those correlations were made. So Sister Frederica raises the question, why was Jesus going to pass by them? Seems a little concerning. Great question. Anyone anyone care to to discuss that? Brother Chris. In, in, in my opinion, I don't think Jesus would have really passed by them. Uh, I think he just maybe just came to reveal himself to them. And in order for them to maybe know him, so to speak, it's like he has to pass or come in their presence. This is just my understanding again. So you're of the view that he actually wouldn't have passed them by? No, I don't think he would have passed by. But even though it seemed like he, you know, he was going to pass by, but in order, it, it, it's just for, it's just, it was just him coming, I believe, just to allow them to know him or just revealing himself to them in another way that they have not seen him. Okay. But okay. it says it in multiple versions that he was going to pass <laughs> them by. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so Sister Keisha also echo, echoed your sentiment. Uh, Sister Frederica, in in terms of why would why would Jesus be be passing them by? So so anyone else care to to um, venture a thought, or also in relation to what we've talked about the whole idea? Because when you look at it, it says he made his disciples. Looking at verse forty five, it says he made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. So while he dismissed the crowd. So I think when you put it into context, and I'm sure the other versions of the gospel that relate the story would frame it in the same way that Jesus had given them instructions of where they were going to go. So I think we have to think about the Jesus passing by them in the context of what their destination was rather than an abandonment um, sort of view. So I don't think abandonment is at question. They were clearly headed to a destination, but that may raise some other theological questions that we've never explored or thought about that I'm completely open to exploring right right as we get to this point in the conversation. Uh, okay, so Chris, sorry, I think you just answered, Mike. I, I didn't finish like why I believe that because the person who Jesus is, he would not have just passed his disciples by knowing that they were in trouble. So that's why I said that. So, so I mean, Sister Frederica has raised the question, which I think is a reasonable question. In the text, it says he he would have passed them by. So, so let me. So you know, I'm going to come to Sister Jan. Sister Jan, I see your hand, and then I'll circle back on the question I was going to raise in relation to what we're talking about now, Jesus 
passing them by. So Sister Janet, go ahead. Hi, good evening, Brother Chris. Um, I just, I'm, I think I'm gonna probably go back to the discernment and just give an example um, that, and I've always bring back my mother because she was a soldier for Christ. So I've always learned a lot of things she tells me. So she was in a hospital and um, there was two people in the, the ward, one beside her and herself. And um, while she was there, there was a blind lady said to uh, her son came and um, and said to um, just come to visit. And the blind lady said to her son, while my mom is hearing the story, she said um, there was a. Um, uh, Aladdin came and visit me, um, but I know him not. And then her son is like hesitating and couldn't understand because she's blind. So I believe my mother discerned the situation that um, God or Christ as a child came to visit, visit this lady, a blind lady, and he revealed himself to her in the hospital but unfortunately she didn't know who Christ was probably because she wasn't grown up to know about God and stuff like that but he did show himself to her even though she's blind she saw this person and then my mother as a Christian realized that this was Christ came and revealed himself to this blind lady in the hospital praise God Amen. So, so that's actually uh, really interesting the way you um, wove in the element of revelation and also discernment. So the way I'm hearing the story that you have um, shared with us is that there was a revelation, but experience helped your mother discern the revelation in that she received revelation so she was able to recognize revelation is that a fair uh, that that's a good uh, analysis thanks okay okay so that's that's interesting um how discern the discernment to revelation relationship i i would well i mean I, let me not make any definitive statements but if we had to fall on one side or another i guess the question would be where would you where would you fall so we're going to come back to discernment because there's still some elements in the text that i think is really um meaningful for us to explore as it relates to the disciples and the miracle events but i want to circle back to the question that that sister uh, frederica raised and so one do you think, and this is a yes or no question, do you think that Jesus would have passed the disciples by if they didn't call out to him? I guess this is a yes or no question. I mean, ultimately, we won't know because the disciples did call out to him and we know the series of events that happened, but it says he was going to he was going to pass by. So let's 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 see if we can take a poll by the raising of hands. So if you think Jesus would have passed by, then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. So Sister Frederica, so okay, see so I see a few folks, a lot of hands going up, um, but not a lot of hands. So. Okay, so I see a few hands. If you think Jesus would not have passed them by, um, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand also. So I see some hands um, for not passing by. Okay, um, is there someone from the he would have passed them by count that cares to share your reasoning why you think he would have passed by. And then someone from the would not have passed them by count to kind of share your thoughts around why you think maybe he would not have passed them by. So let's start with the 
would have passed by Kim. Can I make I, a statement? Hello, it's it's Sister Janet. Can I? Sister Janet? Yeah. Okay. I think he, he because God is who he is and what he say it shall be done. So because he, it said that he would have passed, he would have passed there. So we just have to take it as it is because probably we don't know who their heart is. Those people in the boat, we don't know what the heart is all about. So I believe God would have passed by because he said he would have. But because because they know that he is God and or whoever, like they believe that he's a bigger person, at that time they cry out to him for help. So this is where their faith come and believe that they he would help. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, someone, and then that's really great insight. Thank you, Sister Janet. Someone from the he would not have passed them by camp to sort of share your reasoning on why you think he would not have passed them by. Sister Amory, I guess you're, you're raising your hand. Go ahead. I think that was my, I didn't put my hand down. I must apologize. Oh, okay, okay. So, so someone, someone from the uh, would not have passed by camp to share why you think he would not have passed them by? Um, uh, Mr. Chris, my observation. My observation here, if you look at verse verse um, 46, it says, And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when even came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them um, straining and rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the water. I believe, from my perspective, even though, because Christ know that they were in danger because of the wind, I don't believe he would have passed by and allowed them to um, destroy. That, that's from my, my perspective. Okay. Hmm. Uh, because you see, because when he when he went into the boat, he's still he's still the wind, right? So I don't believe that he would have allowed them for a possible destruction. Well, he's he's omniscient, so he knew what would have happened to them if he did not steal the water. But that's also that's my perspective. Okay, so that's some interesting insight. I think. Both outcomes ultimately lead to the same destination. And so I think certainly just looking at the text, um, and I'm sorry, before I go on, is there anyone else I'm missing? Uh, Brother brother Finlater, your, your hand is still raised. Okay, no um, Okay. Um, anyone else have any comments, feedback that they want to share uh, before I, I continue on? Sister Mitzi. Yes, the scripture said that he was about to pass him by. So I'm going to piggyback on what Sister Janet said that the scripture says that. So we believe that. But I believe there's a reason behind it because he wants to be revealed to them. No, and I, I agree with you, Sister Mitzi. And I think. I I um I never really thought about uh, the question that Sister Frederica introduced into the conversation, which I think is a really great question because again, I think it forces us to engage with, on a on a deeper level with the text. In my view, I think both outcomes lead to the same destination, an expression of the divine in Jesus, and just starting with some comments that you know brother amos made i think if you look in the text and we have to ask ourselves a question around the timing and so it says that you know 
immediately Jesus sent them in the boat. He, he, he stayed there for a while, dismissed the crowd, and then he went up into a mountain to pray. So now we're talking about there seems to be some time and we have to we have to try to understand the time that's embedded in there it may not be explicitly stated, but I think there's an, an implication that there's time here. So it says later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was on, he was alone on the land. So he saw the disciples straining with the oars because the wind was against them. Then it says shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. And so we have to ask ourselves a question in terms of the language that's shared with us. Later that night, he's, he, he, uh, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was on land alone. So later the night, so he sends, he sends them away. He dismisses the crowd. Some time goes by. He's on land. He looks out and he sees that they're struggling. The wind is against them. So is there time between when he observed their struggle and when he went to them may help us really understand if he would have passed them by or not. And then really, too, if you think about it, which is something that I had intended for us to discuss, he never superimposed them to the other side. He simply got in the boat with them and went with them to the other side. So then the question becomes, was there an expectation that even in the opposition that they would still fight through to get to the other side? And is there time in between when he sees them and when he goes to them? That's a question I'd like to um, introduce to the group. Because I think in thinking about whether Jesus would have passed by them or not, what we may be thinking about is the question of whether Jesus was abandoning them or not. And I don't think that is, I don't think that's the, the idea that's at question here, whether Jesus would abandon them or not because earlier we see jesus demonstrating the characteristics of a good shepherd someone who has compassion on people someone who de demonstrates a concern for people someone who is willing to go outside of his intended plans to express compassion and so we see that because he told the disciples let's go get some rest and then he came across people and he had compassion on them started teaching them and then feeding them so i don't think abandonment or Jesus's concern for the disciples is, is what's at play here. But I think there's some really interesting um, elements looking at this as it relates to us as disciples, meaning do we expect Jesus as soon as we, so we're sort of allegorizing the text, um, adding, you know, we talk about the storms of life. So, so when you look at sort of the principle of where Jesus engages as far as our struggles is the expectation that as soon as we face a struggle, Jesus sweeps in to, to, to alleviate all struggles. Or did Jesus see them struggling, left them to struggle, and then would have passed them by expecting them to be where they were supposed to meet him? Because he said, let's go over to Bethsaida and he sent them off ahead of him. So his intention would have been for them to reconnect in Bethsaida. So he had a destination that he expected them to get to. I know that was a, that was a lot. That was a lot. Uh, so um, Sister Frederica, she says, she says, yes, I think there was time between when he saw them and when he walked on the water. If, if that is the case, then can we say that Jesus passing them by would have been an abandonment or is it more in towards what his expectation may have been for them? This is, this is really great stuff. I, have I, think, it was a, I think it was a setup. 
sorry, uh, uh, that's why I, I hear, I, I heard another voice and I hear it, uh, Sister Mitzi. So uh, Sister Mitzi, go ahead. And I'm not sure who that was after, but um, I'll let you. I think it was a setup for the revelation. So you think it was a setup for the revelation? Okay. Yes. Why do you say that? Because of the because of the time, and he knows that they um he knew that they were gonna be in need, and this would be the a, a perfect um opportunity for them to see him for who he is. Okay. No. Thank you. I think I heard another voice. So that's that's. Thank you. For I sharing. like I like what Sister Mitzi just said. A setup for <laughs> the revelation um it's possible that he made himself available by walking on the water so that they could call out to him and be rescued or the the wind cease at that time so <laughs> okay no that's really great insight uh sister keisha says i think it is an attempt to awaken their faith to cry out to god for help it is incumbent on us to ask he is all powerful. He can act even though we don't ask, but to ignite their faith, he intended to pass by. Okay, so I think I think these are these are all amazing and great comments. I want to maybe explore the other side of this discussion. And I do um I don't think we're gonna get to it today because it's uh 741, but I do want to explore this further, this idea of revealed versus discerned and look at the disciples and John um, Mark's comments around the fact that they, they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. So we want to talk about that because I think it has some, some really interesting implications for us as disciples, but just going back to this discussion around Jesus passing by or not. So I introduced the Exodus event where the Lord caused his glory to pass by Moses. That's, I think that um, event would really have been something that would have been passed down through, um, you know, oral retelling of the, the Pentateuch, sort of the, you know, the, 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 the experiences of the Israelites as they were delivered from, from Egypt to the origins of the family with Abraham and just all the events around the promised land and even through the history of the nation. And then certainly as, as the books were written. So, you know, the books of Moses may likely have been far more known, but then uh, Elijah being a very um, uh, well-known prophet in the history of Israel, I think this event too would have likely been very well known and acquainted to the Jewish religious consciousness, meaning the minds of Jewish people and their understanding of spiritual events in their history. The Lord passing by Moses and also the, the reference we, we read about the Lord's glory, I should say the Lord's glory passing by Moses and the Lord's glory passing by also um, Elijah where he was found in the still small voice. And so my question is, if they did not call out to Jesus and he actually went walking by them on the water, would that also have been a, 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 an expression of the divine in Jesus? So had they not called out, because I think Mark's concern here, his, his, his first, his main concern is Christological. It's around the nature and person of Jesus. So would they would, would that have been an expression of the divine within Jesus? Sister, Sister Keisha says he needed to pass by so he could reveal his glory. So could the divinity of Jesus been revealed in him passing by and going to Bethsaida and waiting for them rather than them calling out him stepping into the ship and delivering them from the storm. Anyone care to wager a thought on that? Could we say that the divine nature within Jesus would have been revealed 
by him passing by them in the boat, walking on the water and going to Bethsaida ahead of them. And if yes. Um, <clears throat> Brother Chris, um, the first, um, immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Could it be that part where he wanted to speak to them and let them know that who he is? Because um, prior to this, it was the disciple, he was about to pass the lake. He was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. So he's revealing himself by saying, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. What, that, what does that mean? Because so, that's no, that's that's a great observation. It's so his response is in, so his 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 encouragement is in response to their fear. So they 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 saw. So so they saw they were afraid, and then he encourages them. Right, uh, Sister Frederica adds, yes, but only if they recognized him while he passed by. Okay, so if yes, if if they recognize if they would have recognized him, then yes, okay. A anyone else? So the so the it, I guess it goes back to the question of discern versus reveal. Well, uh, let me open it up for any any um any other comments that anyone wants to make. I'm just well, interested in the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, brother Chris, I would say this is very similar to our real life situation, where in things that happen, that happens to us in our daily life, we we can't even discern that it's God Himself that wants to be revealed in our situation until calamity happens when we we actually get the opportunity for God to show up and show out and reveal himself. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Sister Mitzi. This is a very great observation. Um, Sister Keisha? I was just wondering if there's different interpretation of the word pass by. Like, what does it mean? So we're taking it by face value, to in, like with intent to pass by. But if you look at perhaps the Greek or the Hebrew, that same phrase, does it, is the meaning still the same? That's a great question. So pass by, um, it comes from the Greek parachomaya, parachoma. So the Greek is parachoma and it's translated to pass by. And so it means to go by, pass by, um, to pass away, to come to an end, to disappear, to be taken away. So I think in this case, the Greek word parachoma and its explanation actually gives the indication of a passing by or to go by in the context that we're we're looking at it. It has other meanings. So in another context, it could mean to disappear or to come to an end or to be taken away. But in the context that we've read it, it seems that it indicates that he was going to go by them. Great question. Uh, let me, let me, uh, it's 749. So I'll give someone just an opportunity to make one last comment. I want to continue our next session, just looking at this um, idea of revelation versus discernment as it relates to the disciples and their experience with Jesus and what that means for us today as disciples. So we'll continue that discussion. I'll give an opportunity for anyone to make a final comment, and I'd like to leave you with a question to consider for our next 
uh, next session. So anyone with any any parting comments that you'd like to make? Okay, Brother Finlater threw up your hand. Okay, Brother Finlater, last comment to you. You may be on mute, uh, Brother Finlater. When the disciples saw him coming on the water, they thought it was a ghost, right? Now I believe in real in real in our times now, God could allow us to pass through our difficult times without even intervening, right? And give us the the power to overcome our situation. And by that experience, our we would we would say, well, it it has to be the, the Lord, because I would not have that power to overcome my situation. So I believe even if Christ had passed by and he still the storm, right? In their mind, they would have said, this got to be God. So, so that's those are really interesting comments. I think I, 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 I'm, I'm thankful that you introduced that into the discussion because that really relates to the question that I would like to take away. And so I think you've built in a presumption or a, a conclusion that Jesus would have calmed the storm. But if we look at the actual text and maybe draw some inferences to time, in verse, in verse 47, it appears that there's sort of time built in. We're told that he saw them on land, that they were actually straining, and then he went to them later walking on the water and would have passed them by. So based on Luke, sorry, based on Mark 647, my question is this. If, in fact, Jesus saw them struggling with the storm, having given them directions to get to the other side, and he would have passed by them and met them to the other side, what does that mean for us as what what does that mean for us as Christians and Jesus's expectation for us as it relates to his direction? Ask no one. Back. So the question is based on Mark 647, looking at the fact that Jesus seemed to observe that they were in a storm, that they were struggling against the storm, and that he would have gone by them. What does that mean for us as Christians today? when we are following Jesus's instructions to get somewhere and we face a storm. Be persistent. Okay. Just, some, just some food for thought. So does it mean that... Don't give up. <laughs> does it mean that Jesus expects for us to be afraid and cry out for help and he'll deliver us? Does it mean that he expects us to fight through and make it to the destination that we're given? Um, what does it mean? Just some, just some food for thought. So I'd like you to go away, reflect on this, and I'd like to hear some feedback in terms of your your thoughts around that question for next session. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. This has been okay. One last comment, Sister Magda. Uh, Sister Magda, I think Jesus is already there in our storm. So food for thought. So so you can take that into to, to consideration. Uh, thank you so much. This has been uh, a really informative and, and very energetic discussion and we'd like to continue i think it has some amazing implications for our discipleship today and so thank you all for your participation god bless you richly thank